I'm State Representative Mark Gillen, and I'm right off of Route 10 here in Robeson Township in Berks County, the 128th Legislative District, and I have with me today one of my daughters, Grace Gillen, who has always thoroughly enjoyed her visits to this portion of the district. And today we're with you at Plow Farms, a Christmas tree farm and nursery in southern Berks County. I've asked Mr. Greg Eshelman to join us today. He's going to tell us a little bit, good to see you, Greg. Hi, Mark. About his business operation, which is an important part of the agricultural community in southern Berks County. Greg, we had a couple moments to visit uh, here earlier today. You told me something of the history of Plow Farms. Could you share with that, that information with our audience today? I'd be glad to, Mark. Um, I'm the sixth generation of Eshelmans that have had the opportunity and the pleasure to uh, make our living in the Plowville, Robinson Township area. Our farm uh, has developed from a, uh, a general farm as most of Pennsylvania was um, in the early 1900s um, to today we have a, a wholesale uh, nursery operation and also a retail pick and cut Christmas tree operation. Um, you asked me kind of how we got into the Christmas tree business and uh, again most things you do in life are either timing or accident as, as how opportunities progress. Um, in the early 60s our farm was a general farm. Um, couple cows, some crops, um, the whole nine yards. At that time, they built a interstate highway to the west of us, Route 176. That, when they built that, it, it cut some land areas off and made them um, extremely uh, inaccessible or inconvenient to farm, to run around. We had to drive about five miles to access land that we could actually just walk to very quickly. So at that time, in the early 60s, my dad had uh, the great idea. Um, Harvey Eshman said, uh, hey, why? Let's, we'll plant Christmas trees over there. Um, we plant them, we go back in, and we cut them. Uh, we're going to make $5 a piece on them, and we don't have to do anything. Real simple. We'll just plant them, the customers will come, and there's no maintenance involved. You learned differently, didn't you? Well, the first crop, we did no maintenance. Uh, and we had grape vines and <laughs> briars and, you know, the whole nine yards, and it tree actually you could see right through the tree so we learned um, it was a learning curve uh, but that's that's what that opportunity or disadvantage it actually was a disadvantage that we turned into an opportunity and um, so we had a we've had a pretty successful run in the, the Christmas tree business it's it's been good and that evolved then into the nursery business is there a popular misconception before we head out into the fields and take a look at what you're doing here about Christmas trees, maintaining them, growing them, maturity, and the actual uh, profit lines on individual trees? I think there is a bit of a myth misconception that, like you said early on, you just throw a few seedlings down there and then you harvest and reap the benefits. It doesn't work that way. No, it's, it's like anything else. Uh, the consumer demands uh, a quality tree. Um, and that's what it takes pretty near all year for us to produce what the consumer wants. Um, the, a tree in nature pretty well matures at 20 to 30 feet and actually looks like a Christmas tree at 20 to 30 feet. Our challenge is to get that same tree to look like a tree at 8 foot, 7 to 8 foot for the consumer. Now, as the years have gone on, people have reverted to artificial trees and I know that's a terrible phrase to a Christmas tree grower. How has it influenced your business through the years? Uh, it, it's influenced our business but I, I need to be able to make one statement. Uh, for all the consumers when they think of an artificial Christmas tree, artificial Christmas trees are made out of the same material that your toilet brush is made out of. So if you want to put a toilet brush in your, in your home, uh, think about that uh, when you do that. So all that being said, uh, we, uh, we compete with artificial trees very heavily. Um, what we bring to the table is, uh, first of all, uh, more of an individual product, but also what we're trying to bring to the table is more of an experience uh, to go choose that tree. Um, if you want... The artificial tree, you can get shipped to your door, go to a big box store, the whole thing. Uh, 
and, and pick it up. Uh, what we try to bring is a, a day that you can come to the farm or an hour or a couple hours. Uh, the farm has something to offer, um, and that's, that's what we're trying to promote. It's a destination. It's very pleasing to be out here, and you've got some other amenities like uh, Weaver's Orchards right around the corner. Tell us a little bit about the scale of the operation, number of employees, number of acres you have out here. Uh, we're presently um, we're in um, two two different counties with um, the trees tree operation. Uh, we go from Chester County to we have a farm in Burnville. Uh, we also buy a lot of trees out of Schuylkill County. It's more of a regional kind of thing. We'll take over farms and uh, and go maintain and cut our own trees there. So uh, we're uh, plus or minus 200 acres now under cultivation. Um, employees, uh, it swells. Uh, the, the nursery part of our operation, uh, we have six full-time employees. Um, in peak of the season, we'll be 12. Thanks, Greg. Let's go take a look at that operation right now. Greg, I'm enormously impressed with the amount of work that goes into Christmas trees. In front of us here, uh, we've got a tree that's five years old and you're getting ready to plant, and there's a lot of nurture that's been involved in this tree. Can you give us a little of the background of this particular tree, how it came to be here, and what's next for it? Thanks, Mark. Um, this is a five-year-old Douglas fir transplant. Um, this tree has been moved uh, four times in its life already, its short life. Uh, started in the seed bed in uh, near Erie, PA, out at Berkey's Nursery. We buy a lot of uh, our seedlings and transplants there. They, so it's planted as seed, left in the bed for two years. They transplant it, and every time you transplant a, a plant, you get the option of culling. So we're trying to get the better selections. Um, they grow it for another two years, ship it to us. We got this plant in the spring um, and then uh, potted it up. Uh, we grew it under ideal conditions all this year, and now here we're, what we're doing is fall planting. Um, we're planting on ridges. Um, actually, right now, uh, my son Preston is, is coming into the frame here with um, a machine. That what we use is to build a, an elevated uh, ridge bed on that we grow the trees. Um, the, re the reason we went to this ridge style of planting is um, we have a little bit of some drainage problems here in our soil. And uh, we found that if we ridge the top soil and raise um, plant the plant a little bit, it helps with the root drainage. Um, that's something that every home viewer can uh, put in their own landscape plan at home. A any The ideal environment uh, for a plant is uh, a, a, a mound of topsoil, and that's what we're trying to create out here in the field. I'll have to admit that is a popular misconception when I look over here. I see uh, the ridge line, and then I look down, and I see the fur or the valley, and I think that's where the crop or the tree is going to be planted. And so that was illuminating for me. I see a healthy looking tree here. Let's talk about pests, deer, varmints, rodents, or whatever. What's looking to attack this tree and compromise the integrity of what you're putting out here? Um, the size of the pest varies greatly in the tree business. We go all the way from uh, aphids to a fungus uh, to deer. Um, and we've taken a lot of steps to uh, limit those. Uh, the fungus we do with a fungicide, um, that pretty basic what we, that we treat them. Uh, again, ideal environment, you want the tree to dry off as fast as possible in the morning. A fungus is moisture, uh, so we combat that. Aphids are pretty easy, it's just a little insect. Um, Again, we can control them. Sometimes we use cultural practices, uh, basically try to keep our fields clean, uh, eliminate um, areas for the pests to hide. Um, the, the deer are a little more of a problem. They're a little bigger, so they take a little bigger control, and I think maybe we'll get the opportunity a little later to show you how we uh, combat that. That's the above-ground look. Let's, if you will, go underground. 
soil composition, uh, bolstering in terms of manuring or chemical? How do we build this soil up? And what about Robinson Township in particular and the kind of soil you have here and whether the trees naturally acclimate to that soil or not? We've found, uh, you know, again, site-specific, the best tree to grow in Robinson Township is a Douglas fir. Uh, another uh, type of tree that's a big Christmas tree is a Fraser fir. Um, we have tried and tried for years to grow Fraser fir in Robinson Township. We can't do it. And every couple of years we still think we can and we fail again. Um, what the, again, a Fraser fir is a drainage problem. Um, four days of standing water will kill a, a Douglas fir. Uh, so what, again, like what we've done, this ridge system, um, if you can see the, like we have a, a real fine, um, more of a sandy type of topsoil here. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is promote drainage. Uh, the nutrients, we add all the nutrients. Um, in uh, that it takes to produce a crop and uh, I can actually maybe we'll get the opportunity in another part of the field we do a rotation here uh, so we'll grow a crop of trees takes us anywhere from 10 to 15 years to do a tree crop then we'll actually farm uh, with conventional crops for two or three years to, to get our our soil back uh, where we need it to be like we'll grow corn and soybeans basically We've taken a little bit of a gander at the babies, if you will, and now let's go take a look at some of those adult Christmas trees out in the field. Very good. I think it's important to remember when you come out to the farm here, this is family fun. And uh, we've got a special treat for visitors when they come out to the farm. The Eshelmans have some Newfoundlands, and uh, I know my own family has talked a lot about the dogs out here. Greg, not only do we have a family atmosphere, but you can come out here, you can cut your tree, you can pick it out. We've got the baler over there. So tell us a little bit about the kinds of trees that are available. I know we had mentioned earlier, we're not growing Frasers here, but you have them grown nearby and behind us is a Douglas fir. Share some information about that as you clarify the Fraser fir issue as well. Thanks, Mark. Um, we're standing in the Douglas fir field at the present time. Uh, we talked about the Frasers. Uh, about how we have in Robison, it's a little difficulty growing them, but in uh, Schuylkill County, we perch, which is in Pennsylvania, right across the border, uh, we bring uh, Fraser firs down to our farm for those customers that want them. Um, so what we did, we've ventured into uh, one of our pick and cut blocks, and uh, Mark, being the the representative that he is, gets first pick this year of his Christmas tree. Um, so we're going to actually, uh, they've decided uh, on this Douglas fir, it's about seven to eight feet. It's pretty well uh, that got the right taper, the right color. Uh, this tree has been pruned several times through its life and marks uh, the, the aromas there. Everything's there uh, to make this tree uh, the perfect tree for Mark and his family. It's delightful to look at. Its appearance is stunning and uh, the shape is absolutely symmetrical. However, we know there was some work that <laughs> went into getting this tree to the point where it's at, including below our feet there, we've got a drip irrigation system. Tell us a little bit about the labor that went into fashioning this tree and watering this tree. Okay, Mark, again, uh, the tree was five years old when it was planted out in the field. Planted on a ridge, which we saw earlier, and at my feet, I don't know whether you can pick this up, here is a, a drip irrigation line um, that we run down every row. Um, we have a, a big well here, and as needed, we'll irrigate through dry spells. Um, so, so we have a five-year-old tree. We planted it out. Um, we're eight years out past that now. It's like this tree is probably 12 to 13 years old. Um, every year after we plant this tree, it's been pruned. Um, mowed in the in the row and then pruned and ba pruning um, I don't want to simplify it it's an art uh, the same guys prune every year for us um, but basically what you're doing when you prune these type of trees is cutting the terminal bud off like you can see here that there used to be a bud right on the end there we cut that terminal bud off and by doing that it allows these infill buds to fill in so we make the tree heavier. Um, there, I've just given everybody the whole secret of a, of a Christmas tree farm. I don't think I'm going to be starting a Christmas tree 
farm anytime soon. You've described a lot of work. It's very labor intensive, but obviously you have a lovely product. Well, hate to say this, but I think we're going to go ahead and cut it down so we can take it home. So the next stage of the operation, I think we're going to employ your son, Preston, if I'm not mistaken. I know this is a family affair. And the next sound that we hear is going to be a chainsaw cranking up. So we're going to stand back away from the tree. And uh, I don't know if there's any special insights on uh, chopping a tree down, so I'll let the chainsaw do the speaking for us now. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, okay, Mark. Now the work begins, um, and this is <laughs> what what Mark's going to do is take this tree over to the baler, uh, and we'll package it up. Um, Mark has uh, told us that this is his tree; he wants it. Uh, he's going to stay with it. Uh, we told him, even though we're here in uh, September, we'll keep this tree for him that he can pick it up in December. Absolutely, I'm expecting perfect <laughs> freshness. With many months of waiting. All right, well, we've got the bailing machine over here, and uh, obviously this is your specialty, so tell us something about it. Well, again, Mark, this is the first mistake that Mark made. He brought the tree to the wrong end of the bailing machine. So, so uh, grab a hold, Mark, and follow me, and, and we'll come back here to where we put the tree into the baler. Okay. Trunk first. Doing quite the job here. He's okay. good. All right, we're doing a little trimming at the base of the tree for insertion into the bailing machine. And I'm going to step back and let the pros do the work. Okay, Mark, now what we're going to do, um, Preston will take, take over here. He's going to insert the tree into the baler. Uh, one of uh, the, the men here will hook to the tree, um, and this is where it gets kind of exciting. We're going to take that tree and, and, and what we call bale the tree, um, make a package here that's convenient. And actually, uh, some people have the misconception that this hurts the tree. This actually makes is uh, the best thing to do to the tree. It makes it uh, a lot easier to handle, and you won't have the damage in transport. Um, is that still the tree, Mark, that you decided that you want? Is this the same tree that I ordered? It looks a uh, quite a bit more compact here, but I imagine for the average purchaser, it's going to be a whole lot easier to get this tree home, stick it on the roof of the car, maybe even in the trunk of the vehicle. So they take this tree home. You would think it's obvious. You cut the straps on it, or do you want to leave it wrapped up, and how quickly do we need to get this tree watered once it's home. Again, uh, the truth is that tree would be much happier if it was still out there in the field. So, so it's critical to get this tree into water uh, within a few days. Um, they, they do temper off and harden off um, later in the year. So, so they, it does work to cut a tree and put it in your house in the last six, eight weeks. This has been most informative. Thank you very much. We're gonna take a break here for just a couple minutes, and we're gonna head over to the Eshelman's nursery operation after we have you all load this into the trunk of our car. Back in just a few moments. Thanks, Greg. Did you know that the main entrance to the Pennsylvania State Capitol building is home of two bronze doors that each weigh over one ton? As the primary entrance to this beautiful architectural building, the bronze doors signify the many accomplishments and sacrifices endured throughout the history of the Commonwealth. The magnificent archway over top the doors contains a portrait of William Penn, founder of the Keystone State. The upper panels on the doors commemorate the forming of our nation with the signing of the Declaration of Independence and Constitution. The bottom panels depict the laborious industries of the Commonwealth, including coal mining and agriculture. Now you know. 
Welcome back to Legislative Report. Now, earlier, Greg, you and I had talked about varmints, invasive species, specifically deer. As I look over my shoulder here, I see a rather imposing fence. Tell us a little bit about it, the length it runs, the height of the fence, and what it's keeping out. Uh, the fence you're looking at, Mark, is um, deer fence. Um, we've, in the past three years, four years, have uh, undertaken a project, and we do um, basically several hundred to thousands of feet a year. We're trying to get the whole farm done. We took uh, what we thought was the problem areas um, and started with them. Uh, it does work. Uh, Every now and then we'll get a deer inside the fence and rather than outside the fence, but it, it does change your habits. Um, so we've come, we're in the commercial uh, nursery part of the operation right now. We're, we're actually standing in front of a, a Norway spruce. Um, again, um, it might look like a Christmas tree, uh, but it definitely not a Christmas tree, Mark. This tree, uh, the shape, the color, the texture, everything's Christmas tree-like about it. Uh, the needles are a little stiffer. But again, uh, species-specific, uh, this tree, if we cut this tree and took it into your house, within five or six days, you'd experience uh, needle loss. And that the consumer absolutely uh, doesn't want that and shouldn't have to put up with needle loss in it for a cut tree. So, so this is, uh, again, Norway spruce, a very, very popular landscape tree. We're not cutting this tree at the base. It's going to be baled. It's going to be bald. You've got some specialized equipment here to take care of that. And for what I understand, looking uh, just a few feet away from us, you have a piece of equipment that comes around the tree and vertically bales the tree as compared to what we saw on the other machine. So we're going to crank that up and take a look at how this is done. And I understand that this piece of equipment was also made in Pennsylvania. And that's exciting for me to hear as a state legislator. I've heard about nursery stock that's brought in from other places in Pennsylvania and specialized equipment that's manufactured in Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, Pennsylvania has a thriving nursery business, and, and we also have, uh, I think part of the reason we have the conditions to grow the material, but we also have the demand. Uh, we're on the East Coast where we went through the building boom, uh, and, we ha and we have heavy zoning and all kinds of requirements that people plant uh, live buffers, uh, which helps us. Uh, so uh, along that line, there's been several uh, smaller uh, manufacturers and machine shops that have built, built and designed machines specific to the nursery business. Um, what we're going to walk over, and uh, this is it's called a tree tie, and, and the men are going to pull in here and they're going to tie uh, a tree for us. Um, and the reason we do this is so, we're, you know, our goal is to, uh, to, to harvest this tree as a B&B &B tree and, and what we, we need to tie it so that we can get the digging machine in. So I'm going to kind of let the machine operate itself here. Uh, but you'll see that they, they operate. Uh, they're going to get this up and then they'll open the, uh, open the gate, come in around the tree and wrap the tree up. You know, the gates open. Um, they're going to come in and surround the tree. The, the inspiration for this machine was basically the same as the, uh, the tree baling machine after you cut the tree. So they're going to come in, circle the tree, and then um, and wrap twine around it so that we can harvest the tree. All right, so they're being very careful not to unnecessarily break some of the lower limbs on the tree there and it's going to begin to clamp around the base of the tree and I remarked earlier that I've never seen a piece of equipment quite like this. This is specialized and very unusual. And obviously there's a certain amount of dexterity involved in making sure you've correctly measured this yeah. so what we've done here now the twine they're they're wrapping uh, twine around the tree putting all the limbs in the, in their equal direction the right direction and this will uh, 
save uh, damaging the limbs for when we actually harvest a tree and also when we transport it. Now you've indicated before that this is nursery stock, this is preeminently commercial, and you're baling this up, and by the time you get the ball on this tree, what would you estimate would be the weight of this particular tree with the dirt? Uh, the final product here is going to be about 300 pounds. Uh, our customer is typically a landscape contractor that um, does a commercial or residential job. Um, and they'll, what we're geared up is to, is to dig these trees and sell them by the tractor trailer load. Now the next stage of the operation here, we're actually going to bail this tree out. Can you tell us something of the next piece of equipment that we're going to see? and what's involved in making sure that the tree not only safely comes out but it has integrity in its root system. Well that's the the next portion here is um, what we're doing is getting a B&B, &B, bald and burlap tree. Uh, the next portion is to create the root ball. Um, what, what we need to do, they're going to hook up a tree spade, come in here, that'll actually go, with the big spades will go down in the ground, shear off a certain number of roots, but we want to preserve uh, the integrity of the root ball so that um, when, when this tree is, is transported, and it could be transported uh, as close as four or five miles from here, uh, you know, to the next township or municipality, or we've shipped trees to Long Island, uh, Washington DC you know pretty well the East Coast um, gets these things. Would that be true also of your Christmas tree operation? I know I've occasionally gone by and seen some out-of-state plates they're visiting in the area so not only do you have people on the Christmas tree side of the operation um, coming from places in uh, Pennsylvania but you also experience them coming from out of state. Oh absolutely um, we're fortunate here um, where we're located we have a number of uh, campgrounds locally that we have people come camp all summer they watch the trees grow they come back and uh, stop and pick a tree um, it's amazing how how far they go and also how close you know um, that we have customers that literally walk to the tree field and then we have customers that actually plan a weekend event to get here we mentioned it's a family friendly operation and certainly beyond the Christmas tree farm and the nursery operation uh, there's shopping, there's hotels, there's restaurants nearby. How many have actually made this a mini vacation of sorts? They've come here, they've so enjoyed the area, the experience that they've had here at Plow Farms and they make it a day or two. It's, you've hit it. Um, we have people that they start their day with breakfast. Um, you know, and they go to the, one of the local diners for breakfast and then they'll do, um, you know, the shopping in Reading. Uh, oftentimes they'll stop by and pick their tree out in the morning and say, here's my tree. I'll be back at 5 o'clock to pick it up. And um, they show up at 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. They, they extend their time period quite a bit. So um, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to actually um, get back to the job at hand and dig this tree out of the ground. Greg, we're consummating the process here and back behind us they're burlapping the tree. Can you tell us a little bit about what's involved in finishing this product and getting it ready to ship? Sure Mark, I'd be glad to. Uh, I got to allude to the hole in the ground. That's the happiest thing that a nurseryman can see. That meant that my product is now on accounts receivable. Um, so that's really what our finished product wants to be is we want to ship trees. Uh, as you can see back here, the guys are uh, finishing the, bur the ball and burlap process. They've brought the burlap up over the tree, uh, helps conserve moisture, helps hold the dirt in the root ball. Uh, they're now uh, applying the, the sisal to tie the basket in the tree to make one unit uh, that we can ship to uh, a consumer somewhere um, in, the, in the area. Greg, you and your wife have been a wonderful host and hostess for us here out at Plow Farms. For State Legislative Report, the 128th Legislative District, this is State Representative Mark Gillen at Plow Farms.